Thank you, and thank you for having me here today. So I wanted to talk about managing some of the risks um, and around our portfolio of environmental water. I'll take you through what that portfolio looks like quickly. Um, but really I'm talking about managing the risk to the amount of water we have and how we apply it in the landscape rather than we have all sorts of other risks as well that we need to manage. So it's really around water availability that I'm going to speak about today. Um, so this is a bit of a complicated slide because I didn't know where to start. One was our escalating portfolio um, over time. So hopefully I'm going to press the right button here. Oops, no, I didn't press the right button. Um, the graph on the side there actually shows the, the increase in our portfolio over the last decade. Um, and I'll go through the numbers, so I'm not expecting you to read them off the, off the graph here. And of course, the, the intent of this is to actually be able to serve some of the environmental needs in the basin, which are um, to the left-hand side there. Um, yes, your left, <laughs> um, of the basin diagram there. And we all know how important irrigation is in the basin and everybody's very keen to make sure that that's sustained and that there's a sustainable future. But really the um, objective of actually recovering water for the environment is that we were leaving the health of the basin to chance. And one of the examples that I'll give you quickly, because I'm not going to go through a lot of other detail about how we use our water, but for instance, uh, the Murray Cod there in the bottom um, of the slide, what we figured out over time is that um, Murray Cod nest in their breeding season, and if the irrigation deliveries are going up and down, and we generally run our systems as conservative as possible, so if the irrigation demand isn't there, we stop the orders coming through the system in somewhere like Gunbower Creek or uh, in the Murray below Hume Dam. And so when the dam cuts off and stops delivering those orders, the river falls. And if the river falls during the Murray Cod breeding season, then the Murray Cod don't breed. They need a more stable water level. And so what we figured out over time is we were leaving these things to chance because we were just operating the rivers for maximum conservation of resource and not to think about when those breeding cycles and things were happening. And if you stop those biota, water birds and native fish that are um, dependent on our rivers breeding, you know, once every year or so, and you, they only successfully breed once every, um, or twice every 10 years, then their populations decline. And so part of the whole reform was to think about managing the landscape of the basin and iconic species to be able to have a package of water to underwrite what they need. And so that's what we do. We apply our water um, in the landscape um, and we have a lot of water, as Warwick just said. So uh, that aggregation of entitlements over time means that we now hold $3.3 billion worth of holdings. So it's got a long-term average close on 1,900 gigalitres. Um, that's under 2,700 um, gigalitres of entitlements. And uh, the complexity, I guess, is in the next few numbers that we actually have 100 dif 102 different t entitlement types. So all those entitlement types across the basin have different rules that apply to them and we are subject to the same rules as everybody else. So we operate within the same boundaries um, of other, other irrigators, consumptive users, but we're actually applying our water in stream. And when I said I was going to talk about some of the other risks, applying our water in stream is actually one of the risks because the accounting systems haven't been built for that type of, type of use. But happy to talk about that. Um, and some of the challenges of that in the question and answer uh, section. So we pay the same fees as everybody else. It's an enormous job to manage uh, what's um, 270 different accounts and I think 8,000 licenses across the basin. So we need to manage those, that portfolio and apply it across the basin, generally across about 20,000 kilometres of river system. So we're not talking, you know, just the wetlands that you might see on the, you know, periphery of the irrigation district or the Ramsar sites or whatever. We're trying to actually make changes in the river channel 
as well, like the Murray Cod breeding example. Um, so it's a big space to be applying that water and we need to apply it in this context, of course, climate variability, what the allocations are that are announced to our entitlements, what our demands are, which actually vary. They're not constant things that we know every year we need to supply X litres to this wetland and that will be done time and again. Australia has a very boom-bust ecology and we have to follow those signals. Um, and then, well, of course, we operate in the rules that people have been talking about, which I uh, won't go into, but um, the accounting rules, the trade limits that David was just uh, referring to, and we work very closely with river operators because effectively we're augmenting the flow regime in the river rather than just asking for delivery to a certain point. So the three main things we can do with our water, and this goes directly to managing that risk, is to use it in the landscape in the year that we're allocated it, to carry it over into the next year, or to trade in time. And I'm just going to step through those things very quickly for you. So in terms of using it in the landscape, we've used over 8,000 gigalitres of water over the last decade as that portfolio has increased. And what we do is we actually do planning every year for every catchment in the basin that we hold major water supplies and we identify what we would like to do in different types of water resource outlooks. So in very dry, dry, medium and wet scenarios because we will target different things to happen in that catchment. And then we need to know what the environmental demands are and whether we want to use water now or hold it over to next year. So this is a pretty complicated slide, but I guess maybe the two examples that I'd use is that when we have very low allocations, our main thing is about trying to stop catastrophic loss in the system so that we have populations that can go through the next year. And I'm sure we'll get around to talking about the, the fish deaths, but that is one example of that sort of catastrophic loss in the system. Whereas when we have higher allocations, we're actually to try, aiming to try and create some of that boom in the ecology where birds will breed and fish will breed and migrate around the system and the health of the system will be primed for the couple of years to come. So we, we, we very much respond in terms of how much water that we get allocated to the types of objectives that we're trying to achieve across the system and that really is one of the main ways of managing the risk in our portfolio allocation. The other thing we can do is carry over water and this graph um, shows our allocations every year, how much we use and the purple bars there are the carryover of water that we have had across the whole basin for the last 10 years. Um, the final year, there is, we're only part way through, so don't read the numbers off that as being final. But one of the, um, the things about carryover for us is it's a very strategic choice about whether we use the water now or later. And because it's not about getting a commercial income as quickly as possible, it's about trying to look after the ecology of the river, we will often make decisions that we will Carry, some over, carry over some of our water into other years and that helps us manage the risk in climate variability. And just to illustrate that, one of the reasons in the Southern Basin in particular that we carry over is that the demand comes through the winter and early spring and often the allocation levels actually don't build from the spring uh, until the spring and summer. And so we're aiming to use water often before it's allocated and to have water in our accounts early in the next season means that we've got that water for use because the ecology or the environment of the river doesn't realise that 30th of June has come and it's 1st of July. Um, it needs water in a profile throughout the year. So we carry over to aim to meet our needs and minimise our risk. Then the third thing we can do with our water is trade. And I'll just go through that quickly. So we, we haven't done a lot of trade. So you might remember that I said that we had delivered over 8,000 gigalitres and we've sold 61. So that gives you, you know, the view about this is 
more a tool to use seldomly, but to manage around the system, um, rather than our main intent is to apply the water in the landscape. And that's actually a legislated objective for me as a statutory officer holder. I have to apply the water in the landscape to try and get the outcomes of the basin plan. So trade is limited, and I'll go through a little bit more about that on the, the next slide. We've been very careful and probably actually overcautious in some ways of thinking about when we trade and making sure that there's not going to be an impact on the market. And to make sure of that, we actually publish trade intentions in advance of doing any trade so that the market is not surprised overnight by an announcement. Um, the limitations on trade uh, that other people experience are applied to us. Um, but trade, we can actually trade between catchments, and I'll give a quick example of that. The other thing is that there's zero dollar trades that people often think about, and we make quite a lot of those because we actually transfer our water to state accounts for delivery in the system. Um, so we make a lot of transfers around the system to deliver our water. So recently there's been a call about borrowing um, Commonwealth environmental water to help out with the drought. Um, and we do have a good neighbour policy and we like to work very cooperatively um, with the irrigation industry. But the simple fact is we are receiving less allocations and the landscape is very dry. So the, one of the things I've been saying to people, it's a bit like if you've got a big property and you have to destock it and keep your breeding stock. The environment of the basin is a bit like that. You're going to actually have a lot of death um, of animals and plants across the basin, but there'll be refuges that you want to keep. It's like keeping your breeding stock so that you can recover for next time. So A, we need, we need the water that we've got. Um, and perversely, river regulation kind of masks where people go, oh, there wouldn't have been any water here anyway. But in fact, there is water coming into the dam and there would have been water going through the system. And one of the things that led to the basin plan was the fact that we realised we were putting the environment in extended drought all the time because of the way that we operated the system. So the other thing about the Water Act is that really legislatively I have to only sell water or trade water if it's going to improve environmental outcomes. And that's a pretty hard test to do when you're just being asked to borrow water. And in fact, the Act actually says that I must have proceeds from trade, which would stop me borrowing outright, because I have to receive funds and I have to run an open process. So I know there was a lot of interest in that topic and just wanted to talk. Thank you. Um, so two quick examples of where we've used some of these tools to actually get environmental outcomes in the season. So. Um, in the Edward Wakul system, we had a demand in winter and spring before there were new allocations. We traded some of our allocations out of the Murrumbidgee that we had held into the Edward Wakul, and in fact, that actually allowed trade by others back up into the Murrumbidgee. And so in the end, there was actually a third party benefit of us being able to move our water through the system. The other quick example is in the north where there's continuous accounting in most river systems and we use that continuous accounting to actually profile our water over most multiple years. So in the Macquarie we've had no allocations for 18 months. Um, there is in fact actually uh, restrictions on access even to the carryover that people have in that valley at the moment as the state's been cautious about uh, the dry outlook. Um, and the continuous accounting there, those still allowed us to carry over enough water so that in this year, we've been able to water 8% of the core wetlands of the Macquarie Marshes, which has created that refuge that I talked about early on when there's sort of mass destruction on an environmental scale in many parts of the basin that you've got some, some um, spaces in the basin where you can keep the vegetation and the and the animals and plants healthy. So just um, finally, in terms of looking at the outlook for us, um, the conditions in the north are critical, which many people in the room would know. Uh, states are trying to shore up in the north of the basin to make sure they just have basic needs, and we don't expect a lot of new allocations up there. 
Um, my take is that they're deteriorating in the south, although we could have a bit of a replay of this uh, water year, but I think one of the others, maybe David mentioned, less carryover. Um, if there are very low allocations, we'll get a risk of further environmental damage and we will have limited capacity to actually address some of the, the system effects that are happening. And, and we kind of have some limited capacity anyway, so just speaking very briefly to the fish deaths out at Menindee, I think most people who know how the system operate, if we haven't had any allocations in the north and it's 2,000 kilometres to get there, it's very hard for us to mobilise water from somewhere else north of the catchment. Um, to alleviate a situation like that. So we do have restrictions anyway, but we have been able to address some of the other hotspots. Um, this year in the Murrumbidgee, fish started dying and we've been able to put a flow through the weir pools down there uh, to hopefully ward off any further um, deaths. But I was just trying to give you here at the bottom a very quick example of how our portfolio changes over time. So even though our uh, our, our entitlements have increased. In 16-17, when it was a very wet year, we got uh, 1,278 gigalitres of water in the north, and this year we've got 847. And then in, um, sorry, in the south, and in the north you can see in that wet year we got 443 gigalitres, and this year in terms of new allocations we got just six gigalitres. So that goes to how important that kind of the continuous accounting in the north has been for us to actually supply some outcomes this year. So I think that's it. Thank you, Warwick.